their honesty, they had integrity, their commitment, their passion. This is the one we'll never know. Thank you, Ronnie, for the runaway bus, because those rosy days are few. I think, aside from the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, they were the greatest singles band in pop music history. The Jam were the biggest British rock band of the late 70s and early 80s. At least they were in Britain. Their fundamentally English blend of punked up classic guitar pop, mod image and angry articulate lyrics that attacked the British political and social landscape with spitting fury proved too specific to gain the trio commercial success in America or Europe. But for the young British fans of New Wave, guitarist singer Paul Weller, bassist Bruce Foxton and drummer Rick Buckler balanced the concerns of British suburban youth with short, sharp pop melody to such an extent that Weller overtook the likes of John Lydon and Joe Strummer as the spokesman of his generation. The jam story begins in the most unlikely of places. Woking in Surrey is a typical suburban commuter town in the southeast of England. It was here that a five-year-old Paul Weller first saw the Beatles on television and began a lifelong love affair with both 60s pop and the electric guitar. It's a commuter town and on, on kind of one side you've got very suburban people living in Victorian terraces and council estates and then there's a whole bunch of other people who work in the city and probably have very high paid jobs and always have done. The suburbs are very important to British pop culture. Unlike, say, American uh, culture where it's all for the ghettos, a lot of British bands and a lot of British musicians come from the suburbs, even though a lot of them like to pretend they don't. So the jam came from Woking, and although Paul Weller is, is, uh, is, is, is very working class, he does come from the suburbs. It's not like an inner city kind of music. So, and I think a lot of their audience comes from the same kind of place as well, so they can sing about the issues and talk about the things that their audience completely understood, and I think that's very, very important with the jam. The idea of coming from a parochial place where the majority of people are, are your decent nine to five commuters who are you know, wanting no more than a, a sort of three bedroom semi-detached and whatever, that was, that was the perspective he came from, and, and his lyrics betray a lot of fear and dread of being of ending up as that kind of person. And I think that was what, what made the Jam quite a, a crucial band and why they, they actually um, appealed more to working class kids in the end than, than Sex Pistols of the Clash ever did. Unlike many parents of fledgling pop stars, Paul's father, John, offered constant encouragement during Weller's formative years, eventually becoming the Jam's manager. I said, well, I'll push you. I can't give me, I can't give me an education. I can't give him money. So I'll give him, well, I can give him inspiration, shall we say that, or push whatever a father can do in that, in that cause. For any young band, particularly um, a suburban band who didn't really have access to London and roots in, really does need somebody pushing somebody behind them. It's very difficult to push your own product, especially when, in the Jam's case, they were only 14 or so at the time, weren't they? 14, 15. And Paul's dad, John, was totally responsible for getting them into the, to the London scene. He had contacts up there. He knew people in certain pubs like the Greyhound and the Hope and Anchor and would hustle and get the guys gigs, borrow a van, take them up there, run them around, like any, like any dad, if you like, who runs their son's football team. You know, it was an all-encompassing thing for John and it was a, you know, without him, that, that would never have happened in the beginning. He's always said over and over again, Weller, that his dad was crucial, absolutely crucial to the entire thing. And it also gave the jam again, you know, that the idea that they were a different kind of band to the other bands that were big at the time. You know, the Sex Pistols and the Clash had these insane maverick managers that, you know, had been from the, you know, the left-wing art school scene and all this sort of thing. And, you know, they had their dad. You know, who's going to look after you more in a, in a meeting about money than your own father? If you went along to see the jam, you know, in the early days and then even beyond that, obviously, John was always there. You know, he was always around in the background. Um, there are pictures, you know, in various books or, or whatever, and, and John's never too far away. So I think, you, you know, whilst, yes, he was Paul's dad, I think particularly from, 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 you know, my understanding is that for a lot of the time, you know, that was fine, but actually he was also the, the jam's manager and that was uh, the, the prime reason that he was so involved. The first jam lineup, featuring just Weller and school friend Steve Brooks, played its debut gig at a Woking pub in 1972. After various lineup changes, talent show wins, and a few shows in London, the jam officially became a three piece featuring Weller, Foxton, and Buckler in July 1976. By this time, the 18 year old Weller had had two vital epiphanies.
first was hearing My Generation by The Who in 1974. The impact of The Who's 1965 rebel rock anthem inspired Weller's lifelong fascination with mod, the mid-60s trend and attitude that would provide the jam with their image and youth-orientated lyrical stance. Clothes, hairstyles, energy and an idea that youth was everything. That's what they took from mod. Well, it was a mod through and through because, you know, when he was kind of like um, nine or ten years old, he was watching Top of the Pops or, or he, he was watching these, these bands on Ready, Steady, Go. And, you know, it was The Who and The Kinks and The Small Faces. They were kind of pretty much working class bands as well. And, and you, know, you know, talked about the same sort of thing. All, all those bands talked about what it was like being a teenager, um, you know, what it was like sort of growing up with girls and, you know, at, at being at the bottom of the pile. It was a point of difference. You know, it was a point of difference. These guys turning up in, you know, in their suits and ties in the early days. Um, and you know, pogoing around all the rest of it. They weren't punk, but they weren't the old rock of the 70s. They were something a little bit different, and I therefore actually think that mod influence and the early influence set them apart. And by accident or by design, uh, it meant that they got noticed. The second revelation came in July 1976, when after being intrigued by a review in the New Musical Express, Paul Weller went to see the Sex Pistols at the Lyceum in London. Like so many musicians of the time, Weller was blown away by the pistol's aggression, look and attitude. It was the final piece of the jigsaw and a case of right time, right place. They just kind of embodied that youthfulness, you know. I felt it was quite similar to the mod thing, really. The same kind of arrogance. When punk came along, I mean, basically it was the Sex Pistols and then, then you had The Clash. And then the jam came at it from uh, another angle. I mean, even when like, the clash were, were breaking through and, and the pistols were kind of um, leading the punk pack, I mean, the, the jam was still playing weddings. They saw uh, through this punk movement, through seeing the pistols and the clash in London in 76, you go up there, you suddenly see kids of around about the same age having a fantastic time listening to bands that are playing 100 mile an hour music on stage. Yeah, it influences the sound in the sense they speed it up and they get confident that they've got an audience here. By October, Weller had written a slew of faster, more strident songs. The Jam had played a legendary Saturday lunchtime gig on the pavement in London Soho Market and had even supported the Sex Pistols. The Jam found themselves being swept along with the new punk trend by the music press and punk fanzines and beginning a love-hate relationship with Britain's new rock elite. The Jam you know, with their black and white suits and their striking red Rickenbackers. I mean, it was an image. You look back on those early videos and it was, it was something else. Um, but it wasn't a punk image. You know, you didn't get punks, you know, wearing suits and ties on stage and you would never have the jam with, you know, ripped shirts and ripped trousers and tartan boots and, and safety pins through their ears. A lot of journalists looked at the image and thought, passe, trying to be the Beatles. Well, with Punk, there was a year zero thing, and you couldn't like anything before 1976, and the jam would turn up with all these kind of very blatant influences of uh, pre-1976, pre-year zero kind of music. And I think that was that was used to sneer at them as well. I think in a lot of ways, Paul Weller was more honest. You know, he said, uh, you know, I'm into the Kinks, and I'm, I'm into the Who, and these kind of groups, whereas a lot of the other bands were, but pretending they weren't. And it's all really unfair criticism, because when you're a kid at the time, all these bands are really fantastic. When I, when I was growing up in Blackpool, you could take them all on one level. We had, we had much more fun than the journalists did. The journalists are sitting there, oh, you can't like them, you can't like that. And we're going, we're having this. This is great, this is great. The jams sound great, I don't care if they don't look like a punk band. It does not matter to me. They, they have the aggression and the excitement, which we demand from the bands at this time. Everyone was like really into uh, having an opinion at that time because that was the way it was, you know, everyone had something to say and that went for the journalists as well and I think, I think they were confused. I think there was, a, I think there was a, a confusion around about exactly what the jam were all about. I think this thing about the suits and, you know, but hang on a second, what about that sound and actually what's he saying there? 
I think they w w went on, made a statement, had this um, intelligence about them, but at the same time this sort of raw energy, you know, which kicked. And, and um, I think that's why it divided a lot of journalists at the time. They couldn't quite work it out. Well, I think uh, what you've got to remember, Paul Weller, is that when he made it, when, when he's get, coming through in 76, 77, he's only 17 years old and he's very intense, he's very passionate about his music. So any kind of criticism he's going to get in the press is going to seem, when you're 17, any piece of criticism is going to seem like massive, you know. He, he reacted really badly to the idea of being called a revivalist because he knew it was true. Um, it struck a nerve. It wasn't until all the mod cons they really found themselves. I think that's why that stung. I don't think <laughs> the jam were any more revivalist than the Clash were. I mean, the Clash, you know, ripped off. Um, the Who's, I can't explain with, ten times more times than the Jam ever did. But I guess it was to do with the suits and the mod thing and that whole 60s thing, uh, whereas the other punk bands had, a, had a, a newer and much more contemporary Im image. I think it was an unfair criticism. Yes, there was a certain amount of revivalism in what they were doing, but at the same time, the music did sound very, very current and very, very, very contemporary. In January 1977, the Jam signed to major label Polydor. The band recorded their debut album, produced by Polydor A&R man Chris Parry and young producer Vic Coppersmith Heaven, in just 11 days. In April, the Jam's debut single, In the City, entered the UK Top 40, and the band became the first punk-affiliated band to appear on Top of the Pops. I think it was amazing, you know, when you look back on it, that considering how much had happened in punk before April 1977, um, it was amazing that they were the first punk affiliated band to be on top of the pops. Um, that was an enormous coup, considering that there'd already been quite a lot of activity before that. And um, I think uh, he, Chris Parry was a smart guy and I think he realised that, that punk could do with a pop group. They were only 17. You know, other bands at the time had been around a lot longer. I think Ian Jury had been around for four or five years and, and so had The Clash or, or certainly Strummer in another band. So these were established acts, if you like, to some extent, and the jam were a lot younger and they've just come up from Woking. They'd been on the London scene for only about three or four months but had gathered a tremendous following. Uh, and Parry, I understand, had been following their progress. So when he signed the jam, the time was running out. I mean, it's, uh, you're already into 1977. The thing's happening, so get them in the studio. But this, this, was, this was good for the jam, because the jam had been playing for five, six years. It wasn't like they just turned up from playing, start in 1976, they'd been going to 73. So they were tight, they could really play already. And also they had that energy, and it was a spur of the moment. Everyone's fired up by punk. It's a great time to go in the studio, and I think the debut album really documents the frenetic energy of that time. The jam's debut album, also entitled In the City, was released in May 1977 and reached number 20 in the UK album charts. At only just over 30 minutes long, the album showcased the band's energetic live set and neatly encapsulated punks, or new waves, hard, fast, no flab and no filler aesthetic. In the City is, is it's almost like a, a mirror album 12, 12 years later of, of the Who's My Generation. It really, really is. And um, it, what's good about it is it's, it's so short and so fast and so in your face. And it has this incredible energy. The playing's absolutely fantastic on it. I mean, they do sound really good. The production's really good. It's really powerful. And the songs are great as well. It's, it really does have that kind of teenage, angsty, uh, frenetic excitement about it. It just captures the spirit of the times. That, and that, the youthfulness of the jam is really important as well because there's so much younger, five, at least five years younger than most of the groups. So you can feel that on the music. And lyrically, it's fantastic. You've just got a knack of writing really great kind of social lyrics, which, you know, comes from his heroes like people like Ray Davis, you know, and, and, and The Who, like Pete Townsend, people like that. written gr great lyrics about people, about the audience, you know, about... And you are your audience as well, so you understood where his audience is coming from. And he's also been inspired by all the new groups as well. He's, he's felt the power and the fury of the Pistols. He's felt um, the righteous kind of anger of Joe Strummer. This is all kind of in there, and this makes the jam feel very, very contemporary. Maybe there's only two or three really, really great songs on that, that album. But it was a statement. It kind of put them in. They got it out very early, which was good. I mean, they, they had that record out kind of like uh, in, the, uh, in the spring of of 1977 so so they kind of they got in with the punk early punk so a lot of people who were looking for punk records to buy saw the jam album and, and kind of realized it was all part of the, the same thing that was going on P 
people probably don't realise how difficult it is to make music with just one guitar, a bass and, and drums and and it's kind of it shows how Weller had a really great big great sort of musical brain because the, the arrangements are, are fantastic. If you're a four or five piece band the bass player can kind of hide behind everyone else and, and mess it all up but in the trio there's no nowhere to hide everyone's got to play good I think the jam had a really fantastic uh, rhythm section I mean Foxton and Rick Buckler were like really good, really tight, you know like they, they don't make it too complicated but it's a very distinctive style you know, even now if, if you see Bruce Foxton play Stiff Little Fingers and you hear him playing the bass you think, you could, even if you don't watch him playing you know it's him he's still, it's, it's got a signature to the way he plays, it's like really distinctive even on the first jam album it's there, the band's really really tight because they play loads and loads of gigs and then keep it simple don't mess about you know it's the key of great pop music any three-piece band has to play more to fill out the sound you know bruce was playing almost a rhythm guitar role on his bass guitar as well as the bass and, and rick was having to, to to make larger drum fills and uh, be more inventive with his drumming so yeah it, it may be being a three-piece helped them with the sound because bruce and rick were able to gather that sound together if you like and develop the sound they had through necessity, really, rather than by choice. It was through you know, not having a fo another guitar player. There was times where it's very hard to pick out what f whether Weller was doing it all or whether Foxton was doing it as well. It was a, a, it was a, a small wall of sound. It wasn't the Sex Pistols' enormous overdubbed wall of sound, but it was a wall of sound in terms of how busy Foxton and Weller were. There was all, the, all these little tricks that um, Weller was pulling to make the jam sound like bigger than a three-piece. And, and they did. I mean, they sounded absolutely fantastic. Despite this promising early success, the jam were still outsiders in the UK punk scene. They wore suits and Bruce Foxton's hair was bordering on long. They had no interest in reggae or in sweeping away the icons of the 60s. They wore Union Jacks at a time when the British flag had racist connotations and even said in an interview that they intended to vote Conservative at the next election. A stint supporting the clash on their white riot tour ended prematurely after rows about money and poor sound. The Clash's lyric for White Man in Hammersmith Palais, most people believe that the line about they've got Burton suits, you think it's funny, turning rebellion into money, was about the jam. And it just became obvious after the first 18 months, you know, at all, you know, maybe less than that, that the jam were not going to be invited in. I think an awful lot of his best music from that point was motivated by revenge, you know. Um, I'm, I will prove that I'm better than these guys. Um, and uh, I think that's actually what the relationship with punk mainly did for him. The Jam's brilliant second single, All Around the World, reached number 13 and used violent punk noise to denounce the Sex Pistols' anarchy, equal as a songwriter. The resulting album, This Is The Modern World, was released in October. It drew disappointed reviews and sounded tired and strained. It also failed to reach the UK Top 20. This is a mob world. This is a mob world. I, I think the thing of the punk thing, I think, I think everybody felt it was gonna only go last a year, so let's squeeze what we can out of these groups. I mean, this is, we're talking about six months later, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to have that many songs, even if we go for a long time, we've been stockpiling the songs. The quality control goes all over the place. It's, so I think, uh, yes, the album was a bit of a disappointment after the first album, but there are still really good moments on it. They had taken essentially three years to write in the city, because it was their live set, and these songs had been added, and some had been dropped, and so in the city, as an album, evolved over about three years. There were no new songs necessarily written for it at the time it was being made, whereas six months later, Goodness knows how many hundreds of gigs later, two tours promoting in the city, a single, a couple of B-sides, and they were expected to deliver another album within six months. And it was just asking for too much. Don't forget that they were growing up during all of this. They were still growing up. You know, the, the band was, all three of them um, had things going on that you would at, any, at that time of life. And, and I think the modern world actually reflected that. I still regard Modern World as such an important set of songs because it provided the link. I think without that, 
Uh, and without the songs that were on there, they may never have gone on to develop the sound that they got. It's amazing to see that within like, you know, six months, seven months or something, how far um, the, the jam had, or, had uh, progressed as a group. Sessions for the third jam album were abandoned when their A&R man, Chris Parry, announced that the songs were simply not good enough. When Paul Weller returned home to Woking to write new material and lick his wounds, the jam's future was never in more jeopardy. Yet Parry's gamble paid off spectacularly. Over a few months in spring and summer of 1978, Paul Weller wrote the songs that catapulted the band to another level. An August double A-side single, a cover of the Kinks' classic David Watts, backed with Weller's own A-bomb in Wardour Street, announced a new jam to the world. The stage was set for the jam's keynote album, Ormod Cons. <laughs> I think All Mod Cons genuinely stands as one of the, the most extraordinary creative rebirths of any songwriter and any band that has ever happened to go from this is the modern world to All Mod Cons in, in less than a year. When it comes to third album and you're in the position of Jarmar, which is you've got two albums, got to number 20, you're not the cusp of getting big, but you're not quite made it. Maybe it's time to let's sit down and get this thing right. I think by then it was obvious that they, they, they could ride out the punk thing. The punk thing was, um, wasn't, wasn't so uh, mainstream, it had kind of gone by then, and they were kind of getting their own kind of... Uh, they, they had their own audience there, they were surviving on their own terms. So it's like, uh, maybe he wants to make... With that album, I think he wants to make his the proper statement to make, get the album exactly right, which is what he did. I mean, that album basically saved the album's career. Modcons was that real true style that, that became the jam with uh, you know the cutting Rickenback guitar, um, that the, the bass lines, precision drumming, fantastic, all together in a really tight unit, you know, with some with some really great and different songs on there, everything from Wardle Street, you know, down the tube station, um, you know, to be someone, I mean, yeah, and all Modcons itself is the title track, a really short track, but just a statement, and it was clean focused, stripped down, um, and was, was, you know, it, it really heralded, I think, the arrival of, of the jam as a major force in the music It's about his imagination really exploding. I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, he's imagining. I mean, well, he never done a day's work in his life. And, so, and, and suddenly he's, he sort of develops this ability, which, of course, Ray Davis of the Kinks sort of famously had, is he could, he could imagine himself into the, the lives of other people. And that's what makes that, that thing really special. <laughs> It's just like as a lyricist, you're just thinking, well, this is absolutely fantastic. I don't think anyone else was was writing with that kind of cre creativity at that time. All Mod Cons was released in November 1978 and reached number six in the UK album charts. The mod imagery of the superb sleeve soon began to inspire a full-scale mod revival amongst Britain's pop kids. 
with Weller duly crowned King Mod, our very own David Watts, the iconic boy who could do no wrong. At age 20, Paul Weller suddenly found himself the most admired pop star in Britain. It's fair to say the jam were the instigators of the mod revival because there was no other mod bands around. I think um, a lot of people, a lot of kids saw it as an escape route or a punk or a lot of kids who never quite got into punk and found the mod thing easy to get into because it's not as hardcore as the punk thing. I mean, to be a punk in 77, 78, you, you had to be prepared to take a few beatings on the streets, you know, whereas the mod thing, you could merge into the background a bit more. The jam became their own kind of little subculture in a way. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I just remember at school, it, it, it was this, they were the kind of band that yeah, you know, punk was a bit esoteric and a bit kind of weird, and um, yeah, and it sort of had that outsider thing happening. And the jam wasn't; it was something that everybody could participate in, and um, yeah, everyone became a kind of mod overnight. It was not just the sharp mod suit, but the idea of working class intellect, of short, sharp statements, an idea of boyhood and manhood, sort of on the cusp. The idea of the young, smart guy who knows what's going on, um, and the idea that he he looked good, he he looked worried about his clothes, he dressed well, uh, and and this was an anti-rock thing. As the Jam continued to tour throughout 1979, two more superb singles hit the top 20. Strange Town used a stomping soul rhythm to detail Weller's disillusionment with London, while When You're Young was a pessimistic but rousing anthem for doomed youth which even found a place for a reggae in the late. The next Jam single and album would cement their status as the biggest band in Britain. In October 1979, the band released the Eaton Rifles, a furious rant about the English working class inferiority complex with an unforgettable fanfare chorus. It reached the top three, an extraordinary feat, considering that the other new wave bands at the time were pleased if they entered the top 30. It's funny the jam because you can have always liked them, and this, you know, but you never loved them as much as the Clash. You know, the Clash are always like the bands that are right in the middle of the punk thing. But you know, then Eat to Rifles comes out, and it's like what a fantastic record! It's just, it's really powerful. The jam always made good wired kind of records, but this is like a ballsy record. It's really powerful, a heavy record as well, and a really great lyric on it as well. Again, the class system rears its head. You know. References to Eton, references to uh, poverty marches. It's, it's like loads of stuff like crammed into those lyrics, going all over the place. How better to get people's attention in the UK in those days and in these days than talk about the class system because we're all completely obsessed by it, um, and whether or not we like it or not. And um, for those of us that were at public school, um, that was an interesting song. Uh, and you know, there I was whistling away to it, thinking. Mm, not sure I should be. It's not like the most brilliant piece of music, but but lyrically it was such a powerful set of images. And, and also, you know, it was a big difference from what punk had been doing, because what punk had been on the whole doing was saying, you know, working class good, uh, upper and upper middle class bad, and we will win because, you know, there's more of us and, you know, up the workers and whatever. Weller was, was telling us something we really didn't want to hear, which was going to lose. We we're going to lose because everything was on their side, and you know, losing and defeat is inevitable. We come out of it naturally the worst. We turn the bloody and I will shoot down my shirt. We won the match for their untamed wit. The songs that came before, like Strange Town, 
um, didn't really ever get a lot of airplay. The strength of those sales was largely through the live audiences and through people who'd bought the albums and wanted to see what, what was going to come next. But Eaton Rifles was one that changed that because after that went straight to number three, the song was that good, that the establishment of rock, if you like, couldn't afford to ignore them anymore. You know, the jam had to be let in and, uh, and they were given airplay and they were given TV time. Within a year, they had become a kind of like the biggest pop band in the country, which is bizarre when you think about it. Something like Eaton Rifles, it's got all those kind of slashing guitars and feedback and it's got this very kind of political kind of message at the core of it. And, um, but it was pop music. I mean, the kids were into it. You know, like everybody was into it. it you know, it's like, I can't make a comparison now, there probably isn't one. You know, it just everybody loved that band and saw them as a pop band and went out and bought those records. Even your mum liked them. In November, Setting Suns, the jam's fourth album in 30 months, hit number four in the UK album charts. Setting Suns is a very solid album to me. You've got, got everything from, from um, you know, Wasteland through to Private Hell, which is, uh, as a song, is a, is a really amazing understanding of sort of what's going on in households up and down the country. It's the last kind of early jam album in a way. It's, it's Weller doing the, the character studies. And again, it's just this fantastic kind of ability he had to get inside other people's heads. Like the vocabulary of it as well is just like amazing, all about these kind of um, businesses, you know, showing a profit. He, could kind, of, he kind of understood um, so much about kind of the world um, outside his own experience and, and of, of kind of what people were doing in, in kind of jobs that he, I, God, I don't know how on earth he knew, he knew about all that stuff. For me, I think uh, Thick as Thieves is just a classic jam sounding song. It's just exactly how the jam sounded both on stage, in your bedroom, on your car radio. Wherever you went, that was the sound of the jam in Thick as Thieves. The stage was set for the jam's greatest triumph. In March 1980, the band released a double A side single, Going Underground, backed by the psychedelic dreams of children. It was Going Underground, a stinging attack on British society and apathy which punched home Weller's favourite theme of escape from modern life that got the airplay. The single entered the charts at number one. No big deal, perhaps, in our current pop charts, but it was a virtual impossibility in the early 80s. Indeed, The Jam were the first band to pull it off in the UK since Slade in 1973. <laughs> If ABBA didn't get records go straight up to number one, if the Bee Gees didn't go get records that went straight to number one, um, you know, the, the big pop groups of the time, Rod Stewart, you know, didn't get records that went straight at number one. The idea that the jam, you know, uh, you know, one of our bands would have a record that went straight in the charts at number one was just it was unthinkable. They go totally mainstream at this point. It's it's like a proper number one hit, and but it wasn't a surprise because the band the band already seemed really big. It was a surprise that they didn't have the number one before. You know, they hadn't had massive hits, really huge hits before that. You know, so I th no, going underground has become their signature tune. Really, it's become the song that the Jam are most famous for. <laughs> Some a pleasure as I hate me I've done enough for it on my plate For my least I'm 
I'm attention to relax I'm a true fishing Doesn't drink a flat You see it What you get You may as your bed You better lie in it Thatcher had come into power that year and I think it's that, that whole thing you know it's talking about uh, uh, you know the, the, the nuclear kind of situation and uh, you know and the, the political situation at that time and you know wanting to to kind of get away from it all and go underground into your bunker and lock yourself away. It was a vicious, hard, angry, noisy, grungy record and it was just, it really made you feel, God you know, I mean uh, punk really did change music. I think. It was the real realisation that, oh God, it didn't just change the length of my hair, you know, and, and, you know, the width of my trousers. It really, really changed things. There's absolutely no way that this band should ever have records go straight to number one. It was, it was a fabulous thing. Well, I celebrated by making an unusual fashion statement of wearing an apron on top of the pops. Weller often appeared to look as if he'd been forced to appear on top of the pops. Always a sullen, out-of-place presence amidst the BBC chart show's garish visuals, as these performances show. Watch out for the baffling guardsmen dancing to Eton rifles, and well as comically unenthusiastic miming on Going Underground. I don't think Paul Weller was ever a natural pop star. I don't think he uh, fitted into that pop parade, you know, that kind of prancing about and wearing wacky outfits and false jollity of being a pop star. It's, it's not him, is it? He's, he's a moody guy, you know, he's, he's a creative guy. And those kind of things don't fit in well with um, being a wacky pop star. lots of people where you don't do what you're doing for any real recognition or fame. You either do it because, you know, you really want to do it, you, f you feel that that's what you can contribute and this is where your, your, your personal vibe is, or it's the only thing you can do very well. And if that then leads to fame, in Paul's case, that was probably pretty awkward for him because he's not in any way um, affected by that sort of status. Nevertheless, Jam Fever had truly taken over the UK charts. In April 1980, Polydor reissued every Jam single, and six of them re-entered the charts, equaling the record set by the Beatles for the most singles in the UK Top 50. Encouraged by the Jam's immense popularity, Weller set out to make the most ambitious Jam album so far. Start, a slick, stripped-down, funk-flavoured single with a bass line stolen from the Beatles' tax man, became the second successive jam single to enter the charts at number one. Its release in August 1980 gave fans a sneak peek of sound effects, the fifth jam album, which entered the UK album charts at number two in November. It married the jagged edge of British post-punk with a quintessentially 60s pop sensibility, yet made the joins seem seamless. The one thing that sound effects does 
prove was how good the band were, how good the musicians were, how good um, the songwriting is, and how good they played, or how well they played together. Sound Effects does that, whether you're a huge fan of the album or not. It's versatile, it's different. For me, this one, Lord More Cons, the, the, the two quintessential kind of jam albums, there's, there's really great songwriting on uh, Sound Effects, and it's, it's, it's very varied as well. You can hear there's different influences coming in. There's like a little, the soul thing's coming in a little bit. You can hear it on the horizon coming in. So the, the sound is stretching out now. It's moving away from the... Uh, kind of punchier kind of punk rock roots and it also it's got Pretty Green on it which what a fantastic song I mean that, that was a jam single which never came out as a single it's like a really great song This one's all about money This one's called Free Free I'm going to pocket full of Pretty Green Pretty Green is, is, is one of my favourite all-time jam songs. It's just brilliant. Oh, it's just a great song about money. But it was contrasted with things like Boy About Town, which was very breezy, sort of a real return to the kind of mod thing. Um, but I'm Different Now, which was just a fabulous little punk pop love song. Unlike all mod cons, I feel I've listened to it and I feel I know exactly what all mod cons does. Sound effects, I feel I could be listening to that for the rest of my life. I always find something different in it. And that's what I think is, is, you know, makes the very best albums. Lyrically, Weller's growing maturity led to an accomplished vision of Britain from a socialist perspective. The best was reserved for the acoustic folk of that's entertainment. A bittersweet list of the best and worst facets of the nation that still stands as well as greatest achievement as a songwriter. While touring America and Europe, the Jam also remained true to their career-long ideal of releasing one-off singles that would not be released on album. Perhaps in response to the enormous UK chart success of the Escapist New Romantic movement, May 1981's Funeral Pyre was the most abrasive record the Jam had ever made. A nightmare vision of a fascist Britain, driven by Rick Buckler's crazed, militaristic drum rolls. The single only reached number two, Still pretty good for a furious mess of a record. <laughs> Funeral Pyre is a, it's a, it's a really fascinating song, really enjoy it. There's the, you know, the rhythm in it, I mean the importance I think of Rick and Bruce, you know, in that um, has been documented um, and um, I think that comes across and I think there's a lot going on there. It's quite interesting to see the jam, who at that point already looked to have been a very traditional kind of band. Actually, you know, picking up, uh, not sounding like Joy Division, but obviously picking up the atmosphere of Joy Division and kind of more of the post-punk thing. So he's obviously very hip to what's going on and it's, it's affecting his music and, and it fits in with their music as well. I think, for me personally, Funeral Pyre was an interesting direction that they could have gone down. I mean, probably wouldn't have sold as many records, but it would have been a very interesting kind of uh, tail end to the jam's career. I guess the fatigue was starting to show. I mean, they, they banged out like a, a, a series of really great albums and then and punk had finished. You know, they'd had their, you know, they'd become the biggest band in the country. It was kind of, where'd you go next? 
I mean, Funeral Pyre was a, 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 a fantastic record, but it's, um, it, it's not a particularly melodic record. And then um, he does Absolute Beginners, which is very uh, influenced by that new funk sound that was coming through the Spando Ballet and uh, Haircut 100 and all those people. And, you know, obviously Weller was a big funk fan. But it's that point, I guess, where the jam um, start to kind of lose their way for a while. Um, you know, it just kind of, they turned their back on the classic sound and they didn't really know where to go next. The classic jam power trio sound was consumed by funk soul beats and a charging horn section. It was the biggest clue yet as to where Weller's musical and stylistic concerns were heading. But even the loyal jam fan base wasn't so sure. Absolute Beginners was the first jam single to peak outside the top three since 1979's When You're Young. For the first time you could feel jam fans beginning to get a little bit impatient almost. Um, you know, they weren't flocking straight to the shop and just buying it and going, well, you know, it's the jam. You know, they bought Funeral Pyre, they'd gone, hmm, it's not actually very good, is it? And then they actually listened to Absolute Beginners before deciding to go out and buy it and decided that wasn't that good either. So. I think it was the first signs that perhaps he was feeling constricted in the Jams lineup, and that he was trying to find his way to other things, and that maybe Foxen and Butler weren't going to be the way to do that. In November, the jam began recording for what would come to be their final studio album and fashioned yet another career-defining triumph in January of 82. <laughs> As the double A side Town Called Malice and Precious single debuted at number one, Top of the Pops paid the jam the ultimate compliment, allowing them to play both tracks at the close of the show. The first time a band had been asked to perform both sides of a single on Top of the Pops since We Can Work It Out and Day Tripper were performed by the Beatles in 1965. Precious sees Weller getting increasingly funky, but it was the organ-led Motown-esque town called Malice that dominated British radio in the early weeks of 1982. It was certainly towards the end of their career, and it was perhaps one of their first truly great moments. It was a terrific song, wasn't it? And if any song stood the test of time, that one has. I still hear that being played in clubs and airports, and I was in Africa um, earlier this year, and they were playing it around the hotel, the pipe sound in the hotel. It was quite bizarre to find the jam down in Botswana, wouldn't it? It still sends a shiver down my spine to this day. I just think it's just this most fantastic, um, critique of what Margaret Thatcher had done to ordinary families in Britain, um, set to a Motown beat. I mean, it, it was just like, it was, it was great. A uh, whole street's belief in Sunday's roast beef gets dashed against the co op. I mean, it's just it's poetry. I mean, just no one else was just doing anything as, as uh, clever and as poignant um, as that at that time. Anyone that would say that the song was a little bit messy or whatever it is that they, they say, you know, I, I, I think that's the great thing about the band. You know, there, there's a band that can, can um, you know, can produce things like Malice and Tales of the Riverbank, you know, and Absolute Beginners, and then have that sort of forceful clashing sound of a funeral part. It's the same band, you know, and that's really, and that's cool. And I, and I don't think it was about just releasing anything. I think it was about, look, actually, yeah, there are lots of different ideas still around here that, you know, have come off maybe the back of, of sound effects and, and all the rest of it. And actually, you know, we want to put across that we can do this. 
it's, it's probably the best of the uh, last day uh, jam songs. And it very much picks up on the, uh, the kind of soul kind of vibe. It's got that kind of Tamla Motown bass line in it. It's got a, you know, it's got that kind of feel of that kind of the sound he's working on. But, but it's it's really successful because it kind of marries it with the kind of uh, aggression of the jam. You still got kind of a snarl on the vocal. And it's, it's one of the best love kind of jam singles as well. So it proved that that kind of soul thing would work really very well with the jam. So may, maybe. Another couple of albums of it, it kind of meshed up more, but the, really the, the gift is, is, is almost like an in-between album. It's kind of the jam going somewhere else, but not quite getting there. Objectively, I realise it was their last great moment because, you know, there's no doubting its, its skill and, and, you know, the production value. It's, it's a great single, you know, and it had hit written all over it as soon as you heard it and all that. Um, I just think it's quite trite compared to what he'd been doing. Um, I, th I think, I honestly think the jam had reached he and the Jam, as, as a band, had, re had reached something amazing on going underground and sound effects. And that, it, and that it was downhill from there. Both tracks appeared on March 1982's The Gift, the first and only jam album to reach number one on the UK album charts. Despite finally making an album that equaled the chart-topping feats of their singles, The Gift received a less than enthusiastic response from critics and fans alike. Dominated by horns and soul and funk-derived rhythms, even featuring a steel band on the calypso influence The Planner's Dream Goes Wrong, Jam fanatics appeared somewhat bemused by the lack of typical guitar rock rabble rousers. Well, you fight, can't you see that it's you? That ain't no ghost, it's a reflection of you. The, the, the band themselves as a trio were very good at playing certain styles of music, but where he wanted to go was somewhere else, and I think the gift is it's kind of a result of that. I mean, it's got good songs, some good songs on it, but it's, he's, he's kind of in a different place now. He's not the jam, he's not doing jam style stuff anymore. The, the soul thing's very, it's, it's, it's pr pretty well taken over the whole sound at this point. In songs like Ghosts and Carnation and, and Happy Together, there's some really interesting stuff going on. And uh, um, it's actually a much better album than I think a lot of people gave it credit for at the time. It's moving towards a more kind of funky dance sound and, you know, horns on it and um, a lot more sophisticated arrangement strings, string sections. Um, I think it was clear that they were kind of over as a, as a band by that point. You don't really notice Rick, Rick Buckler and Bruce Foxton. You're noticing the arrangements, you're noticing the horns, you're noticing his voice, you're noticing the melodies. It's the first gem album where you don't really notice them. And, and I should imagine that told him in the long run that he didn't really need them. Tours of Europe and America completed what was now six non-stop years of jam activity. At last, the band took a break. But while Weller holidayed in Italy, he came to a decision that would change the lives of all three jam members. He returned in July and informed Buckler and Foxton that the jam were no more. The shock split made national news in the UK. The jam have announced they're breaking up. The group are led by singer and songwriter Paul Weller. At 24, he's become something of a spokesman for the new beat generation. He's pronounced on politics, life and music to fans so enthusiastic to receive his message that they've come from America and Japan to hear him. We went to meet Mr. Weller just before he finally unjammed the jam. Why stop now? Because I feel we've achieved enough, you know. I think we've done all we can do as the three of us. I think it's a good time to finish it. I don't, I don't want to drag it on and, and go on for like, you know, for the next 20 years doing it and become nothing, mean nothing, end up like all the rest of the groups, you know. I want this to count for something. I want everything I've done you know, the last five, six years to count for something. Weller's dismissive attitude to his bandmates caused a permanent acrimony between the three former schoolmates from Woking. Weller, Foxton and Buckler have not spoken since their last show 
at Brighton Centre in December 1982. The idea that you would say in public, I love these guys and, you know, hey, I couldn't have gone anywhere without them and, you know, we'll work together again someday and uh, that whole kind of thing would have been an utter sellout. Um, you know, it would have been sentimentalising it, it would have been playing on the, the sentiment of the audience and trying to get a bit more money out of them. Um, you know, Weller's attitude to, to those sort of things was, what's done is done, mate. Your future career does at least look fairly played out. What about them? Some people are saying, aren't you dumping them? Well, it's a lot of crap, innit? You know what I mean? It was like, it's a group, we work together as a group, you know? It's not my responsibility, you know? They'd, they'd gone from um, playing weddings to being the best, you know, the biggest band in Britain in about three years. And, um, I, you know, and it, they must have just got f sick of the sight of each other by, by 1982, I would have thought. Everyone was completely shocked that the jam was split up. I don't think people were expecting it at all. It just came right out of the blue. It's just a complete bombshell. But in hindsight, you look, look on it and you think it's, it's absolutely perfect. Because most people talk about quitting at the top, not tarnishing the, the legend or whatever. And the jam, the jam were probably about the only band that actually had the nerve to do when I say the jam. Paul Weller was probably the only person that ever had the nerve to do it. I think Paul wanted to do something big. I think he felt he... He could, and actually he has, in the end. Um, great career move, really. Fittingly, one of Pop's greatest ever singles bands decided to say goodbye with a hit single. Beat Surrender was a satisfying end to the jam story. It previewed the horn and keyboard-driven pop soul Weller would pursue without the jam. It was upbeat and optimistic, and it went straight into the charts at number one. After selling out five nights at Wembley Arena in London, playing an emotional last show in Brighton, Britain's unofficial mod city, and releasing a live album, Dig the New Breed, which reached number two in December 1982, the jam went their separate way. Come on, boy, come on, girl, Chicago to the beat To actually just stand up there, probably against everybody's advice or instincts, and to say, no, I'm going to kill this, dead. I'm going to just, you know, we could have had a massive advance for the next album, etc., etc. To say, no, no, I'm not going to have that. I'm going to, because artistically, I want to do something else. Um, that must have taken a lot of guts, and it must have taken a lot of guts for a kid who's 24 years old to do that. I mean, it was astonishing. The minute he quit the jam, he quit the jam. You've got to admire this guy. This is not, and this is what does make him different to John Lydon. You know, John Lydon always had that, from the mid 80s onwards, he had a streak of cynicism. Like, you know, one of his albums was called This Is What You Want, This Is What You Get. You know, he wasn't being covering it up. It was like, oh God, if you want Jolly Rotten Pants One Punk, I'll give you Jolly Rotten Pants One Punk. Paul Weller, no. No, he, he, you know, he would never, ever stoop to that. If Bruce Foxton and Rick Butler felt abandoned by their young leader, Time would prove their fears well-founded. Buckler joined the short-lived Time UK and reunited with Foxton in late 80s band Sharp before lack of success led to him quitting music for a career restoring antique furniture. Foxton kicked off a solo career with a 1983 hit, Freak, before sliding quickly into obscurity. He now treads the boards with aging Irish punks, stiff little fingers. got to look at it from their perspective, you know, that they were in the biggest band in the country. One day the leader of the band, the songwriter, walks in and says the band doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, not a discussion, not a debate, not a negotiation, not a, should we take a break for a couple of years and see what happens? 
No. Bang. You're sacked. I think uh, for Bruce Foxton and Rick Buckley, there's it was, it was obviously a bombshell as well. I, I mean, you're, you're, you're playing in the most successful band in Britain, and one day you turn up at rehearsal and it's not there anymore. That, that, yes, it must have been a hell of a shock for him. They, they were young when they started, you know, they were, they were school kids, weren't they? And they grew up. Um, to have the time of their lives. They, they saw the world, they made fantastic music, they played great shows to huge audiences. That's nothing to be angry and, and bitter about, is it, at all? Paul Weller, of course, joined with former Dexys Midnight Runners keyboardist Mick Talbot to form the Style Council. It was a clean sheet, really. It was a little bit like, oh, that was then and this is now. And I think to, 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 to morph the jam into that would not have been possible. I don't think they could have done it. I think the musicians were up for it. You know, I think a lot of the Star Council songs would have been much better had Bruce played on them or Rick played on them. I don't think it was a question of that at all. I just think it was this clean break was needed with the record company too, who could then promote this new music with a new name, with a new you know, style, if you like. And it was away from this, this, the, the traditional jam sound. always looked like him and Mick Talbot were better friends than, than perhaps than he that maybe that he was the, it was that creative partner that maybe he hadn't had since Steve Brooks um, who was a friend as well and who shared his sense of humor and who shared his politics and who shared his attitude to life if you look at the sort of star counts top of the pops appearances and you contrast them with the jam top of the pops appearances you know yes of course the jam are a more exciting band but and, and yes, it was very, very useful for all of us that they stood out on top of the pops because everybody else was grinning and jumping up and down. Paul Weller looked like he was going to punch the cameraman, you know. But, but if the question is, was he happier in the Star Council, I think you only have to look at those top of the pops clips to see a man who had lightened up. Nevertheless, the council permanently adjourned when Polydor refused to release a fifth album heavily influenced by Chicago house music. After four fallow years in a jazz-influenced wilderness, Weller made a triumphant solo return with 1993's Wild Wood album and was promptly hailed the godfather of Britpop. His 60s-influenced back-to-basic solo career continues with his ever-loyal fan base treating him with the same reverence reserved for Weller's own 60s heroes, Paul McCartney and Pete Townsend. It's really, really difficult sometimes to listen to his solo stuff and hear the same songwriters who wrote same songwriter who wrote Going Underground or whatever, but but perhaps that is a real thing of, you know, he's, which happens to an awful lot of people that get elected spokesman for a generation at some point. They get tired of being looked for, you know, looked at for answers. I think Stanley Road was, was a good album, and that, that was the album that broke back really big again, and it fitted really well the time as well, you know, it's all the, all the kids buying Oasis records could relate to that record as well. And again, that's the whole thing about Wale, he's writing songs that people could relate to. It's a, again, it's a song, but it's the album titles from the road, road he grew up on, and he's going back to the suburbs, singing about the suburbs, singing about where you come from. The fact that a jam reunion has never even been entertained by Weller explains why he's still held in such high esteem. Even through his own dark years in the early 90s, it never seemed to occur to him to reform the jam for what would be one of the most lucrative reunion tours in rock. No matter that some jam fans might find his somewhat retro solo music not to their taste, none of us who love the jam can deny the energy and commitment he still brings to performing and his refusal to sell out. So I must be a wonderful thing. The jam had something that I really don't think has ever been captured again. And it's the ability to be fresh and exciting, intelligent, commercial, because they had to be, and have a huge impact. I'm not afraid to 
Is it just Town Called Malice? Is it just because that song's still played regularly or that's entertainment? Uh, and if it is, does that mean that everybody nowadays is missing out because they haven't heard um, songs like um, Music for the Last Couple or they haven't heard songs like Wasteland or To Be Someone off All Mod Cons or Dreamtime or Thick as Thieves off Setting Suns? Because if you haven't heard those, you haven't really heard the jam. That's entertainment and Town Called Malice isn't all the jam was. Um, that was just a small part right towards the end. They were a live band that showed that you could do an incredible amount with three guys if those three guys are focused and energetic and you've got a great songwriter, um, that you could do a lot with it. And I really think a very important thing about their legacy is they stopped and they ain't coming back. And good for them. More than any other band of their era, they really documented what was going on. And they, for anyone who was brought up in that period, they were just like the, the just greatest thing that ever happened. The Jam's early self-descriptive slogan, fire and skill, still flows through the Weller veins. And it's that fire and skill, along with the biting poetic anger of Weller's best songs, that remains the lasting legacy of the jam. The distant echo of faraway voices, bold and faraway tries. They wrote really powerful, great rock and roll songs, and they had great lyrics in there. They said something that related to our lives, and they sang about British things as well. They weren't singing about American things, you know. It was, they were a great British band, and they sang about our lives. It's not a patriotic thing, but it's great to hear music that refers to kind of life and the concerns that you have yourself. if I move for change and pull out the queen I don't think you can compare them. I don't think they re they, you can you can identify areas of some of the songwriting and some of the performing with what had been before, a bit of punk, a bit of soul. But I don't think you can I don't think you can set the jam up alongside anyone. I think I think they I think unique is the word that comes to mind. And that's why they are still thought of in such a fun way. I was there. I know I, I remember them because I've still got their records um, and saw them play live. Why people still love them today? I suppose it takes us right back to the start, doesn't it? Right back to what we said about the first album. It's because the music was good enough. It was good enough to last. <laughs> Thank you. 